Good evening. Welcome Trinity Tigers and friends of Trinity University. Welcome to the first virtual Food for Thought lecture series. The lecture series has been a tradition of Trinity University for more than 30 years. Ten lectures planned for this academic year are brought to you by the Trinity University Alumni Relations and Development Division as part of its ongoing lifelong learning initiatives as well as our talented and stellar Trinity faculty members. I'm Gary Ramey, a graduate of Trinity University from the class of 1970. I earned my JD and LLM degrees from Southern Methodist University, Dedman School of Law. Prior to joining the faculty of St. Mary's University School of Law in 1982, I practiced law in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and served as police legal advisor for the Irving Police Department. I currently serve as professor of law and a co-founder and a frequent co-director of the St. Mary's Institute on World Legal Problems at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. I teach, write, research, and consult in the areas of criminal law, criminal procedure, and law enforcement issues. I welcome everyone to tonight's event. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Juan Sepulveda, and our moderator, Dan Abbasi. Professor Sepulveda is the Ron Calgard Distinguished Visiting Professor of Practice in Political Science. He has served as PBS Senior Vice President, launched the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics in the Obama Administration, and helped reelect President Obama with record level Hispanic support. He authored The Life and Times of Willie Velasquez, Su Voto Es Su Fos, Your Vote Is Your Voice, a biography that relates the organizational history of the Southwest Voter Registration and Education Project. Professor Sepulveda has a BA in government from Harvard College, an MA in politics, philosophy, and economics from the Queens College at Oxford University, and a JD from Stanford Law School. He is also a member of the State Bar of Texas. Tonight's moderator is Dan Abbasi. Dan is an investor and entrepreneur and currently serves as the managing director at Douglas Winthrop Advisors, LLC, where he co-manages the firm's environmental strategy. Dan has been affiliated with climate-focused private equity firms, an energy efficient turbine manufacturer, and an Emmy award winning TV series on climate change. Dan has worked for or volunteered on multiple campaigns. He earned a BA and MBA from Harvard and an MA and PhD from Stanford. I would like you who are watching this webinar to know that you will be able to submit your questions at any time during this presentation by using the Q&A tab that you'll find on your screen. The questions will be summarized and we will submit as many as we can to Professor Sepulveda. Professor Sepulveda and Dan Abbasi, thank you for being the first Food for Thought presenters for 2020-2021. Professor Sepulveda. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to everyone for kind of joining us today uh, for this conversation. Uh, it's great to kind of be here with you and to have, have this conversation tonight. I want to say thanks to Dan for kind of joining us on, on the moderating side here. Uh, we, let me go ahead. We're going to pull up here. What I wanted to do up front was just to kind of to do a quick, almost kind of campaign 101, a couple of key questions and just some things for us to be thinking about uh, to help us kind of set the stage for the conversation tonight. So you see in the first slide, Something I share with my students and for those of us who've worked in campaigns are kind of the five basic questions that any campaign is going to have to answer in order to in order to try to win. And we know a lot of times you don't win. A lot of my friends will talk about at the time being in a political campaign is like running a restaurant. Most of them fail. Uh, so it's tough. Right. And so but but when we look at these five questions, I wanted you to think about them, because as you're thinking about the rest of the election cycle, these are kind of the key questions that campaigns from the local to the presidential level are gonna to have to figure out and they're gonna to have to kind of answer. And so who are our targets, right? When we think about 2016, President Donald Trump won by 
less than 80,000 votes across the three states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin out of just a little bit less than 137 million votes that were cast. We're talking 0.06 of 1% that would have changed the outcome. That showed you how close things were. A little over 10,000 in Michigan, 47,000 in Pennsylvania, a little bit over 22,000 in Wisconsin. So when we think about who are our targets, this first question becomes really important for campaigns to figure out who is the, what's the magic number they need to kind of get to victory. We're gonna talk in a second here about key states to be looking at. We know that for the presidential election, this is about electoral votes. This is not about the national popular vote. You've got to get to 270 electoral votes. So that's a key piece. You know, do you go to the base? Are you trying to persuade folks? Who are the types of folks that you're looking at to, to make up your kind of coalition? Uh, you know, we're going to talk about some of those things in more detail. We know that a lot of folks have already made up their minds. So we'll talk about that as well. We also know that people are following the election more closely than they have in the more recent past. There's just a lot of attention uh, that folks are kind of giving to right now. How do we reach them? So we know that once we kind of figure that out, there's gonna be a lot of things you see earned media going on. President Trump, anytime he gets on television, he knows how to grab those headlines, whether they're good or bad, but he knows how to get them and to get kind of eyeballs on him. There's TV advertising. There's a big movement towards digital and social media and finding the right mix between some of these. Uh, we know that there's direct voter contact and particularly this time around in a pandemic crisis, there's been a lot of questions of what's the right strategy and the tactics to do that. Can I go door to door uh, in canvassing in the midst of a crisis? Then when we kind of figure out how we're gonna reach them, what do we tell them? What are the key messages? What's, what are the drivers here? What's really kind of going? We know that with an incumbent administration uh, this is a referendum on how the current administration is doing. Do they try to turn it into a choice election or does it just get focused on purely the folks who are in power? And so we'll talk about what people are doing in the strategy, the strategies to what we're going to tell them in the particular messages. How are we doing? It's a checking. You're seeing a lot of the polling that's going on right now. You're seeing what they're doing in terms of fundraising. You're seeing what they're doing in terms of voter contact. You're looking at the electoral map right now. This is a chance to kind of just check in to see what's actually the stage of the, the current stage of the presidential election. And then the fifth one is what are they doing? And what are they doing is not just the other side, but a lot of times, particularly at the congressional, at the presidential level, are also our allies, super PACs, right? Because in Citizens United, there are people who are trying to help us out or on the other side that are independent from us. We got to kind of keep track of what they're doing as well so that we can kind of stay on top of that as well. So those are just kind of the key questions we wanted, I just wanted to mention to you. We know when we look at this notion of the 270 electoral votes that you need to become the president, there are some states that are the most important states. There are a lot of states that unfortunately really don't matter at the presidential level because they're already going to be on the Democratic or the Republican side. For this particular cycle, we start out with six different states and a couple of congressional districts that really were the beginning stages of what we call the battleground states, the ones where most of the money is going to go to the, the more than a billion dollars from the two, two presidential campaigns of the third parties. So you can see here on the screen, Arizona, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin as the starting point for the six most important states. You can see the number of electoral votes that they, they have there for each state. Nebraska and Maine are a little bit different, right, because they actually cut up their states by congressional district in addition to the state outcome. So in Nebraska, in Omaha, there is a, a, the congressional district two that is a battleground, it's up for grabs. And we have a comparable one in Maine in their second congressional district. So those are key states to be looking at. We'll talk about what's kind of going on in them right now. We know beyond that, there are places where the campaigns are trying to, to win in places where they didn't win last time, right? They call them expansion states or growth states. So for President Trump and his campaign, Minnesota, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Mexico, and Maine itself, you can once again see the total number of electoral votes, but are places that they're trying to, to bring onto their side to expand their map to get to 270. Uh, and when we look to the former Vice President Joe Biden, 
Georgia, Iowa, Ohio, and for a lot of folks who are on this call tonight, the state of Texas. We'll talk about where Texas is in terms of its status of moving towards being less red to pink to maybe purple. But those are states that the Biden campaign, where it has been a kind of a Republican stronghold in the last couple election cycles, do they have the ability to kind of to bring it back? Uh, the next map is just a map, and this comes from Real Clear Politics. If you're interested, there are lots of different places you can go. This one I just wanted to show you so you can see. We know that for the U.S. Senate, in addition to the presidential election, is going to be a key contest to see whether or not, in this case, can the Democrats take back the Senate? The current numbers are 53 to 47. Uh, and so we know right now that the Democrats would need to win three seats and the White House in order to get to that magic 50-50, then the vice president, in this case, Senator Harris, who would be the vice president-elect, would be able to cast that tie vote, to break the tie to, to the 51st. Uh, if, we, if the Democrats don't win, then if, if President Trump is reelected, you're going to need four. But we'll talk. I just wanted you to see the map. There's a dozen plus Senate races that are kind of up for grabs. We'll talk about some of those and see, see what folks are kind of thinking about in terms of uh, what's happening with those Senate races. But we know that uh, as a starting point, for example, that in Alabama, Doug Jones, who is a Democrat who won that race in a very red state, is very likely to lose. So the numbers are actually going to go to four and five. It'll, it'll, the Democrats, for all realistic pur uh, purposes, they're going to need to pick up four seats and the White House in order to take back the Senate, five if President Trump gets reelected. And the final slide I wanted to kind of show tonight, and here I think we're going to pull it up so that you can kind of, uh, I wanted you all to be able to see something that you can kind of play with here. So I'm going to ask these folks to help. Yes, thank you very much, John. So you can see here, you can go online to the Cook Political Report. There are three different companies that really kind of do a great job of putting out public information on their forecast, whether it's for the House, whether it's for the Senate, whether it's for the presidential level. The Cook Political Report is one of them. What I like about this, and this is why I wanted to show you all, this is what they're calling their 2020 demographic swing -a meter So what they did was they took the results from 2016, and you can see on the side there are different demographic groups. It could be white non-college graduates, white college graduates, the African-American vote, the Hispanic vote, the Asian vote, and they've plugged in what the percentages were from the last election. The map that you see in front of you is updated to the 2020 voter profile, right? Because we know the demographics have changed a little bit. Over time, the American electorate has become a little bit less white and more folks of color in the percentage. So this kind of shows us on the map. You can go in there and play with the different percentages. What happens if the, if the vice president gets a higher percentage of this particular group or if Donald Trump does better with a particular group so that you can see and the map will change colors to show you uh, who's going to be winning in the different states. But it's kind of a fun thing for you to play with, to test, test your own assumptions to kind of see what you think each campaign is going to need to be doing to kind of take those things on. But I just wanted to kind of point that out to you all kind of as a starting point as well. Wanted to keep this short up front because I know a lot of folks have a lot of questions. So that's just a real quick kind of jump into key questions to be thinking about, battleground states that are going to be really important, expansion and growth states on both sides of the aisle uh, and with both campaigns. We'll talk about the different Senate races as well. Uh, and then I just wanted you guys to see this one so that you could play with it as well. And with that, I think Dan and I are going to kind of, we'd love to kind of get your questions and start the start to be able to respond to what you guys are thinking about. So let's see what you got and I'll turn it over to Dan and let's get going. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for kicking us off and thank you, Professor Sol Sepulveda for that stimulating uh, uh, opening presentation. And uh, hello, uh, Trinity Tigers. I think most, not everybody is uh, uh, a Trinity alum, but uh, uh, again, my name is Dan Abbasi. It's a, it's a privilege to be with you to, to moderate the segment of, of tonight's Food for Thought session. Um, you know, I'll just say that I've known Professor Sepulveda for well over 30 years and have long uh, really admired his skills as a thinker and successful practitioner of the, of the fine arts of politics. Um, so I'm tempted, I have to say, to ask you all to do one of those Zoom sing-alongs and attempt a, a rousing rendition of your fight song, which I guess is called Go You Tigers. But I am going to restrain myself. Uh, I did not uh, alert the logistics team that I would ask that, so I won't. Instead, I'll ask you all to submit questions 
uh, using the Q&A tab. And uh, I'm going to read those out. I might group some of them together, depending on what comes in. Um, and we'll, we'll, sort of, uh, we'll sort of kick it off here. So uh, the first question is from David Wishaman, uh, who is uh, a graduate, political science graduate, uh, 1980, and also Econ 81. Uh, his question is, what is the likelihood of uh, uh, TU alum Senator Cornyn being reelected? So I guess, uh, Juan, uh, Professor Spalva, do you need to get into the prediction business here? So get out the call. What's the likelihood? Thank you, Dan, and, and thanks for that question. So at this point of the election cycle right now, it looks uh, very high. Someone's already answering for us, right? So it looks very high uh, that... Uh, Senator Corden is going to get reelected. Senator Cornyn is going to get reelected, one of our Trinity alums. I mentioned before that in case you're interested, so they're changing on a daily basis at this point. It starts to happen a lot when you see the changes. But in addition to the Cook Political Report, I would also recommend that you go check out Inside Elections. Nathan Gonzalez is the head of that group. Uh, and then Larry Sabato, who's a political science professor based out of the University of Virginia, has Sabato's Crystal Ball. Those three are the kind of the public forecasting groups that people really rely on and the media relies on and, and trust them because they do really good work. When you look at those three different folks, those three different outfits, they have the John Cornyn, MJ, Hagar race right now. Two of them have it as being a likely Republican win. Uh, Inside Elections thinks it's a little bit closer, so they have it leaning towards Senator Cornyn. Um, so right now, I think it looks like Senator Cornyn is probably in a really good place. Uh, when we think about when I mentioned the different Senate races right now, there are probably 14 Senate races in the U.S. right now that are at some level kind of competitive. Uh, Senator Cornyn is 14th, right? So it's not one of the most competitive races. It, it, there's a potential that it would, it would take a lot for him to kind of go down. So he's probably the safest of what's considered to be slightly competitive races. Uh, we, we'll talk about some of the other ones uh, going along. But obviously, it's interesting to see right now. So while it's very likely that he's going to win, you're starting to see really interesting things happening here. If you see any of his ads statewide, uh, they're a little bit counter to what you think of in this case, for example, the messages that President Trump is seeing. You will see Senator Cornyn in a mask, wearing a mask in his ads. You'll see him talking about issues like health care. You'll see him talking about all these other issues about delivering to constituents on jobs. And so when you start to see what we know are some of the most important issues and a message around the virus where he's literally wearing a mask in a number of them, you can see that he's obviously thinking, I've got to do things a little bit different in terms of what I need to do to kind of uh, to make things kind of happen. So that's kind of where it currently is with uh, Senator Cornyn. Great. And I'm just going to remind people, uh, try to put your questions in the Q&A tab uh, instead of the chat tab. And I'm going to try to combine these. I'm going to see, I see they might be starting to pop up in both places. Uh, Professor Spalpita, one quick follow on that. We spoke earlier today and you mentioned that the, the Biden campaign has just purchased uh, maybe $6 million in ads in Texas. Is that a reflection of him thinking that they have a realistic chance at the presidential level? Or, or could that have something to do with potentially this down ballot race, uh, the statewide race, uh, uh, Senator Cornyn? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a great question, right? And so I think there's a couple things going on. You know, one of the questions was kind of how are we doing, right? When you look at the fundraising side, the Biden campaign is just doing amazing in terms of their fundraising numbers. So they really have, out, have been outraising President Trump uh, for the past few months in a big way and also have a lot of cash on hand. So what's interesting is, and this is a challenge for a presidential campaign when you get to the end of the campaign, you want to be raising money, but at some point there's a notion of where do I actually place the dollars? And so I think the move to put money in Texas is obviously a positive for, for putting Texas into play at some level, but it also tells me that they have extra money. Uh, the folks who are running the campaign who are people we all know well, I know well, um, you know, Jen O'Malley Dillon, who leads the, the Biden campaign was our deputy campaign manager in 2012. She is schooled in the Obama way of doing politics, which is do not take anything for granted. Act like you're 10 points behind. Do not take your eye off the prize. Get to 270. So when I see them doing something like, you know, a $6 million is a lot of money. And, and it's not a lot of money for the size of the state that we are, but for the amount of money that has been placed in Texas, which has been a red state for a long time, this is a significant kind of buy, right? So we'll kind of, we'll have to see what that really means. 
Does it, is it really a response to the down ballots? My gut tells me it, it's all kind of tied to each other, but there's no doubt, you know, when you're seeing the polling averages kind of making this thing closer, few points away, we know that Trump won Texas by nine points last time. Uh, anything that's kind of in the single digits is going to be progress for the Democratic Party. But I think that's kind of where things are with Texas right now. Okay, great. So maybe Texas is uh, uh, more in play than in previous cycles. But the next question is from Isabel Far uh, Framer asking about Ohio in this respect. And she says, uh, seems to be a battleground state again. What chance realistically does uh, Vice President uh, Biden have on this one? Great question, and uh, wish I could see you, Isabel. Hello, hello, hello. Great to great to see that you're joining us. Um, so Isabel knows better than anyone else kind of what's going on in Ohio. Uh, and so what's interesting is that this was not originally a battleground state. What's interesting is once again, as we get to less than 30 days left in the election, and the truth is the election's already going on. You know, we, let's be honest about that. As of last night before the debate, the numbers I saw, they're already almost five and a half million people who've cast their votes. So voting, the election's already started. Ohio was up for grabs. It's a real thing this time. No one thought it was going to be, you know, unfortunately on the Democratic side, they thought it was gonna be tough to recapture Ohio, but it looks like it is in play. You're seeing both sides uh, putting money uh, there that, uh, that shows uh, even more than say what's happening here in Texas. Uh, and once again, I think for both sides. We know that from the Trump side, uh, we know that they've got a really solid base of supporters, but the ceiling is pretty low, right? So they need Ohio, right? And Ohio, and Isabel will tell you, and all, all my great friends in Ohio will tell me, you can't win the presidency without Ohio, right? And so we know that's a huge deal. Uh, so Donald Trump, President Trump knows he cannot get reelected without Ohio. President Biden, former Vice President Biden, sees this as a way to add another path to getting to 270. And that's a positive thing as a campaign. You don't want to have a narrow path, a path, a single path. So this becomes a part of the notion of there are a number of ways for the Biden-Harris ticket to get to 270. So I think there's a real chance that Ohio is in play in a way that we weren't expecting a month ago. Okay, great. Um so, uh, how does the current, this is from John Lozano, a uh, great question here. How, how does the current electoral map um, at the moment compare to the comparable map at this stage in the prior presidential election? We all, all know that there was some kind of a surprise outcome there in light of what the polls looked like. And so what, what, uh, what inferences can you draw comparing the last cycle at this moment to the current cycle here about 26 uh, days out from election day? And of course, the election's already underway. People are voting today. That's the other thing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question, John. So, so what we know is if we look at comparable periods of time, uh, the former vice president is in a lot stronger position than where Secretary Clinton was four years ago. And there's a couple of differences. So you'll hear a lot of people talking about, oh, the polls weren't right last time and this is, could happen again. And, and obviously the Trump side is hoping that will happen. There are a couple of things that are different this time that I think are important for folks to be thinking about. One is at this stage of the game, Secretary Clinton had sizable leads in the polling, particularly in the battleground states, but she wasn't at 50% in any one particular state. Uh, Joe Biden is. He's, he's hitting 50 or plus in almost all of the battleground states. That's what you need to win. There's also not a strong third party or fourth party candidate presence this time. Not a, there, are, uh, there, there is a libertarian candidate, there's a Green Party candidate in not all of the states on the ballots in all the states, but you don't see the kind of um, the early percentages of people leaning that way that would allow you to win with less than 50 kind of percent. Uh, and you're also seeing kind of a, a, a larger, uh, this is a more recent phenomenon after the first debate, uh, after uh, we're starting to see what's going to have the impact of the president contracting the virus, but you're seeing a little bit of movement towards expanding also uh, the, the actual numbers. So not a little bit different than last time, but those are a couple of pieces that, that make it a little bit different. Now, once again, you know, the other thing I would say to keep in mind, I mentioned this quickly, you know, I'm a believer when I look at the data right now that this is, it's always a mix of persuasion and the base. Folks who are already on board, and I, they're my base, I gotta get them out. 
versus how many people are still up for grabs, right? And so, but we know the numbers, the number of undecided voters is pretty small. Most people have made up their minds, right? So the question really now here is, there are two things that are going on. When we see those numbers in the polling at this stage, the bottom line is from now to, to November 3rd, how do I actually get my base to show up, right? And we know in a pandemic, there's a lot of challenges to how you do that in a way that you stay healthy. There's a lot of changes in the rules and the games. Each, you know, the 50 states in DC all have different regulations on how they carry out their voting procedures. So we know it's a tricky thing, but that becomes a really important piece of the base side, right? People are, they've made their minds 90% plus. The estimates are anywhere from as low as 4% to maybe as high as 10, 11, or 12 who are undecided. But we know that the undecided portion is still critical because if the race is anywhere, if it tightens up and gets really close, those undecided voters could be a key. So the campaigns are also trying to figure out, you know, what do I do with the undecided voters? How do I kind of, how do I get to them? That's a little bit beyond John's question purely on the polling side, but it's something for us to be thinking about as well. But that's kind of the, the current state when we compare now to four years ago. Okay, great. So you just answered Gary Greenblum's question, which is what percentage of voters remain undecided? And you said about four to 12%. I guess in the 2016 cycle, what, what you said was Secretary Clinton was below 50%. So what, maybe that argued for more allocation of resource to going at those undecided voters. And now would you say, would your inference be that this is really just about get out the vote? Uh, you kind of said there's still some persuasion going on, but if you were allocating right now, if you were running the full campaign, would you be doing more to get out the vote relative to 2016 at this stage? No, no that's a great question. Th thanks for the question, Gary. Good to see you. Well, I can't see you, but I'll wave at you, Gary. Thanks for your question. Um, so I think there's a couple things. One is, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the Biden campaign is in a really strong place because of their fundraising. So they are able to do both. They don't have to choose, right? You can do both the work that you need to do to get your base out. Uh, and then also to do the persuasion work. And so, you know, as we start to think about what does that look like on the Biden side, right? You're, we know suburban voters. We know white female voters, white female voters in the suburbs. We know it could be the rural vote. We knew it could be the military and vets playing off of some of the comments that have been made by the... So we know that there are groups that within those that have undecided voters that the campaign are trying to figure out how best to get to them. And what's interesting, and once again, you can go online, there's a swing voter project that uh, you can find online where that's literally what they're doing. So you can see some of the focus groups and what they're learning. One of the key things that they're learning is that for the small number of undecided voters, ads that are direct, any messages that are direct attacks on President Trump don't work. They're actually interested in going back to the old set of issues that are really important to families and to people, right? To, to jobs, to the economy, to healthcare, to education. And so once again, campaigns have to be smart about responding to what they're hearing and kind of making that adjustment. Oh, I thought this attack on President Trump was gonna work. Oh, they're talking about the schools in their neighborhood. They're talking about jobs and are they gonna come back and, and what's gonna happen with my healthcare? And so they're doing the right mix of responding, I think, uh, to doing both of those pieces in terms of the messaging. Great. Uh, you talked a few moments ago about you know, the challenges in a pandemic, the uh, TV part of this, the get out the vote part. And uh, uh, a question from Bradley is, what changes in voter turnout are you expecting at this point because of COVID? Um, and, and also related to that, could this affect the accuracy of the polls that we're seeing that uh, might be misreading sort of what's going on out there? So. Two separate uh, but interrelated questions. Yeah, so I think uh, it's a great question. So I think what's interesting is because of, like I mentioned up front, because of such a high interest in the campaign and people just feeling like this is just such an important uh, election cycle, uh, my gut tells me voter registration should have been going down because of the pandemic. And it did in certain places. But even here in Texas, we actually had decent numbers given that it was hard for people to do their usual uh, out in public door-to-door -door kind of canvassing work. So you can see that the enthusiasm on both sides uh, to really to participate is there. So I think people are assuming that we're gonna have more than the nearly 137 million that were cast in 16. There's no doubt that it's gonna be tricky to see 
with all the things that are going on to see whether or not um, people could get past the challenges to actually make that happen, right? And so you're hearing both of the campaigns uh, in different versions kind of telling their base and their supporters, you need to get out now and you need to get out early. Now, we know that the polling is telling us, I mentioned that as of last night, almost five and a half million people have already cast their votes. The information we know from that 5.4 million plus is that the Democrats, uh, because in certain states, they, we have partisan registration. We don't have that here in Texas. But in a number of the 31 states that are already kind of accepting and kind of getting mail-in ballots, it's like 54-25, an advantage for Biden over Trump, Democrats over Republicans. But we also know that Democrats, by large numbers, are telling pollsters, um, I'm going to vote absentee more than I am coming in person on election day. So the Trump campaign knows it's the opposite for them. Their supporters are looking to coming in person. So no doubt they're going to have a, a bigger surge of supporters on election day in comparison to the Biden campaign. So that's going to play itself out in terms of how we think about the actual numbers as well. Here in Texas, for example, I mean, we, you know, and folks who've been following it here, uh, the, the courts have kind of uh, allowed, uh, the governor has extended the early voting period. So in Texas, our election starts next Tuesday, the 13th, and, and we have until the 30th on the early voting side. Um, we know that for the first time in this election cycle nationally, there are a number of groups who've come together to have a national early voting day uh, celebration and organizing. So on October the 24th, on a Saturday all across the country, you're going to have bipartisan groups from across the country saying, let's all get out early. So there's going to be a lot of those kind of efforts that I think are going to help make sure things get out. But there's no doubt that it's going to be tough. And you're seeing the battle with, uh, with the rules in so many of the states. That, But the campaign's job at this point is to, well, I remember we went through this as well. And we were like, am I crazy about this particular requirement? No. Is it the wrong thing? No. Do I think it's actually hurting and depressing the vote? Probably, but you know what? Those are the rules of the game, and that's what I have to then figure out. And so I know that that's what both campaigns are doing right now, of figuring out what the specifics are that they're going to have to do uh, to make it happen in each one of their uh, each one of the, the key states. Great. Now we have a lot of good questions coming in, uh, Professor Spolvita. Let's try to pound through a bunch of these with about two-minute answers. These are great, robust answers. Um, uh, so next one is from Larry Moon. Given the extreme polarization of the country at the moment and the style of discussion we're seeing between the candidates, uh, particularly in that debate, uh, is there any hope for the country to get beyond this split? Um, and do you think uh, do you think we're as polarized as the media presents us to be? That's a great question. Uh, and so I think I actually don't think we are as polarized as the media is presenting it out to be. And there are a number of political scientists, particularly some of our colleagues who are out of Stanford University, who have actually done the research to show that the, the polarized uh, electorate that we see is partially being carried out through the media uh, that we're seeing, but it's also kind of in the interest of the elite politicians, the folks in DC, the presidential elections, the Senate races, the congressional races, that if you actually look at what voters believe around particular issues, what we should do around immigration, uh, what we should do around the death penalty, around different kinds of questions, there's actually a lot more agreement than disagreement. And so whether it's here in San Antonio, uh, you think of other places about what it means to be the mayor of a city, for example. And once again, you know, for us in San Antonio, we've got another Trinity alum, uh, you know, Mayor Nuremberg, Ron Nuremberg, who's a Trinity Tiger. Um, you know, Mayor Nuremberg, it's not about Republican or Democrat. It's a nonpartisan spot where he's got to figure out how to get it done for the city, right? So I think there's, I think of Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles. There are a lot of great mayors who really are getting it done and showing that, they, that it isn't as polarized and the communities are coming together to take on things. We've got a challenge though, right? Cause it's, this is a, you know, Donald Trump is not the first one to kind of help move this to a polarized. It, it's a part, it's a symptom of a larger part of the system. So there's no doubt we still have things to do at the national level but I think what's happening at the local county level shows that there's promise for us. Good. So that, that would imply that part one of Larry's question uh, would be that, you know, given that the media may be exaggerating this kind of, if it bleeds, it leads and 
kind of covering the extremes and the fringes um, that maybe you think there is hope for us to get beyond this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to the next one. Thank you for that. Um, we have an anonymous question. Uh, why do you think President Pr uh, Trump declined to attend a virtual debate? Is this a strategy uh, or is this just uh, from the gut? So yeah, we're all guessing on this one, right? So you could, you could imagine a number of kind of possibilities uh, as to that answer. Some people would say, I think for his side, they would say um, he's a great deal maker. This is the first throwing out of a possibility and he's now negotiating in public to get a better deal, right? So that could be a possibility. Uh, there could be other folks who are saying this is a stance for him, right? To say, I'm not gonna do anything virtual because that reminds people that we're in the pandemic, uh, that the virus is still going and you can't even come into person. I'll show that if I'm in person that that's, I'm optimistic, that's who we are, that's how we're gonna beat this thing. And so you can imagine it's also tied to the messages that they're hoping to kind of get across as well. So the real question is, you know, is it gonna happen, right? And there's no doubt that this next debate was also supposed to be a town hall format, right? So the process is really important. Um, and if you're one of the candidates, it's a little bit trickier to go after voters asking you questions than you interrupting a moderator, for example, right? And so I'm sure even that notion of how the next one as being a town hall was probably something that they weren't as crazy about in terms of the process. So we'll have to kind of see, but that's my kind of first set of possibilities, right? Great. The next one, I'm skipping around a little here. Uh, you're an aficionado of polls, uh, Professor Sepulveda, and there's a question here about the mechanics of polls, which is, how do you know Trump supporters respond to polls since most do not trust news? And this one is from Stephen Cox. That's a great question, right? So that's kind of the, there's a little bit of that, um, you know, they, in political science, we used to think of this both as kind of like the Tom Bradley effect you know, who was an African-American running for mayor of Los Angeles, but there were a lot of voters who would end up not saying they were going to vote for him and not, not being able to telling a pollster that somehow wasn't the right answer or something. So the question is, are there Trump silent voters, right? Are there, are, and, and I think the data is showing us right now that that's probably less likely to be true, right? There's no doubt that, um, you know, not all polls are the same, right? And so, and I always tell people, if you're, probably the best place to go is to 538 because in addition to just kind of collecting the details of the polls, they literally grade the polls, right? And give them a grade. So you want the, you want to understand for people who know their stuff, like Nate Silver and his team does to be able to say, can we trust a poll? Is this a democratic poll? Is it a, is it a GOP poll? Uh, is this some of the gold standard? And so, and the other thing we know, and I always tell people at this stage of the game, because you, we're going to get hit with so many polls, is you don't want to fall for the latest poll, right? That at this point, you want to be looking at the polling averages, and then once again, seeing which polls are the strongest ones. Sure, there's still a possibility uh, with that small percentage of, um, of the undecideds that they could be kind of coming back to the Trump side, and maybe that's not showing up in the polling. But the real question is, is it going to be enough, in this case, uh, to close the gap? Great. A couple of questions I'm going to combine here. One is from the, the related. Darby Stacy is asking, given the, the increase in mail-in ballots, uh, how long do you anticipate it will be before we know the winner? Will it be on election night? Will it be some duration after that? And then related to that uh, is of the states to watch, which would be probably the swing states you talked about at the top of your talk, which are expected to not be officially decided on election day because of the number of mail-in ballots that won't be counted until election day. So when will we know and which states? Right, and so the, the great questions, and once again, it, that one was from sorry, Tenno uh, uh, Villarreal. Tenno, all right, great. Tenno, he's a good friend as well too. Thanks, Tenno. Tenno knows this stuff. So there's a couple things. One is there is all about the assumptions, right? If if the polls are accurate today, then we'll know that night, right? Because the the gap is large enough that. Uh, the votes that will come in after election day will not be as important. And then, but if it's close, then it can be. So what happens? So, so where are some states to look at? They don't, they don't know this as well too. Florida is a key uh, marker. Florida is a key marker for a couple of reasons. President Trump cannot get to 270 without Florida. Former Vice President Biden can, but we also know that Florida's counting ballots as they're getting them. So we're gonna know 80, 90% of the Florida vote that night. So for example, if the former vice president is ahead in Florida that night, the election's done, 
right? Now, for some reason, uh, President Trump, who is, that's a state where he's doing better in the battlegrounds, say he holds on in Florida, then we, and we, then we go to some of the Rust Belt states. We go to Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. They're not that close right now, but if they tighten up, they'll tighten up, they'll, they'll always tighten up as we get closer to election day. But if for some reason they get really tight, then it gets trickier because of the large amount of mail-in ballots that are kind of coming into play. And you're going to see it now the, the, you're seeing some of the challenges already. So the question is really going to be about what is a legal ballot, right? And so here, you know, what I've told some folks that I'm most worried about, I'm not, the president has obviously kind of made the case that he's worried about fraud. We all know that there is very small evidence of fraud that is taking place. Has it happened? Yes. Is it a huge problem? Absolutely not. But we know that what I'm more worried about are spoiled ballots. People who are doing this for the first time and don't know, they put their signature in the wrong place. They didn't get a witness. In some states, uh, you guys have heard about the naked ballots, right? You have to have two envelopes in a particular state and it only shows up in one and it doesn't have the other one, it doesn't count, right? And some states will allow you to correct a mistake if it happens ahead of the election time, other states won't. So once again, the campaigns are gonna have to be really good about the specifics of what it means to kind of take care of this so that we don't have, in the primaries, for example, during the virus, we saw six to almost as high as 10% in some of the states who were pretty new to doing this because of the virus uh, in terms of the percentage of spoiled ballots. That's not a good thing, right? So that's probably what I'm worried about most. Okay, great. Um, let's see, the first, uh, we had the debate last night, vice presidential debate. I see the first question related to that, which is, uh, sorry, I've got a long list here, I lost track. Oh yeah. Do you believe Vice President Biden and Senator Harris's unwillingness to answer certain questions, like whether they intend to pack the Supreme Court, uh, hurts them in the eyes of the voters? That's a good question, right? So I think, so, you know, you could see from both sides, you, could see, you saw it in the debate last night where they were, and I tell folks again, um, from the campaign perspective, it can drive you crazy as a voter to say, didn't they just ask them a question and they actually didn't answer it? But if you're the campaign, your job is to stay on message, right? And so there's no doubt that both sides were trying to get their messages across. And I, this is my take on it, that I think for the Biden-Harris team, taking a stance on what's going to happen to the courts, I'm thinking, my gut tells me they're thinking it's, they don't want to talk about it. We're really honest about it. And taking a stance one way or the other is not, I, I'm guessing, not going to give them enough of an advantage. Uh, so for the best thing for them to do is to, is to not really answer the question. Now, once again, that's, don't, don't be surprised. This is not like just one side. The others, both sides do this. There are things you want to talk about, things you don't want to talk about. Uh, now, the, you know, for us as political scientists, there's that question of not just what's obviously best for the campaign, but we know that there's been a growing mistrust of governmental institutions, right? So even beyond the campaigns or which side you're on, the questions is how do we as a society get back to restoring faith in the institutions as we're moving forward because they've been hit over the past four years in particular. Um, so I think that's a, a bigger question for us to be thinking about as well. Great. Any data, uh, Professor, to, to present on kind of young voters under 30 years old? Uh, that one is, uh, sorry, that one is from, uh, from Debbie. And then related to that, um, do you think polls currently reflect young voters such as Gen Z and millennials? Uh, this is from Giovanni Escobedo. Uh, and uh, Giovanni's asking her, or do you think their participation may surprise us? Presumably, will we see higher turnout among young voters than we've seen in the past. So a couple quick comments on young voters. Keep it relatively brief because I want to try to get through a bunch of these other ones. Sure, oh, sure. Thank, and thanks, thanks, Gio. So the first question was just about turnout for young voters. Was that the question again, Dan? Uh, just any, any kind of you know, uh, yeah. data on young voters at this point. Uh, the and best thing for folks to do is go to the Harvard Institute of Politics. They're the ones who do the polling aimed at young voters 18 to 29. And they're showing right now that what's interesting is their polling is showing that there is a higher um, following of the campaign and people who are saying, for example, for college students, it's been in the 40s, they're showing in the 60s, right? Now, we also know that during the Democratic primary, there was a lot of talk of that. Bernie Sanders was attracting a lot. And in the end, the numbers didn't happen. 
For us on the Obama campaign, we were able to bring up youth vote, but I always tell people it was four times more expensive for us to do that than a traditional voter who is a consistent voter, right? Um, and so, and then Gio's question, the second part was about- uh, Yeah, do, do you think- up like in the poll. Poll, And will we be surprised to the upside by actual voting? Yeah, so that's what, so good question, Gio. I said, that's why you wanna to go to the Harvard poll. I think there is a question of them not being a part of the sampling a lot of times, just because of how tough, and it's just in general being getting tougher. No landlines, cell phones, not answering my phone, that kind of stuff. But that's why I would really kind of encourage folks to look at the IOP polling. Okay, great. Uh, there was a question about, you, you put up the battleground states earlier, and what, what makes the Ohio demographics different from uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania? That's from Steve Wayland. So, so they're, all, they're all, none of them are the same, right? So we always have to be careful about what we're talking about there. But, but there's in general, kind of that upper uh, kind of Midwest kind of Rust Belt set of states. What seems to be a little bit different of Ohio, I think, compared to some of the other places are, and you see this more happening like in a place like Wisconsin, and that's really around um, a still large percentage of white working class voters, right? Non-college educated voters more so than Michigan and Pennsylvania, for example. And right, and so that just changes the electorate a little bit, right? And so, uh, and you also see a switching over in 16 uh, and even going back to 12 a little bit in some of the folks more in 16 who kind of moved over from the Democrats who had voted for Obama, for example, who moved over. So the real question is whether they'll stay there or not, but the profiles are all a little bit different. Um, you know, I would include, there's a great Washington Post series that's going deep into looking at these, I'd say folks should go look at that. They kind of look at the different states within each state. You can go to the Census Bureau to get the 2016 voter profile to see what it was four years ago by these different categories, or even that uh, swingle meter I was talking about. That'll give you a chance, because I don't want it, because I always tell people, we, it's too easy to paint them as all being the same because they're kind of upper Midwest, they're all a little bit different. So it's important to kind of really look at each state individually. Great. Um, and related to that, Dr. Alex Flores is asking, what is the Democratic Party doing effectively to reach the working class, uh, considering that they've been hardest hit from, from COVID-19? So question about reaching that demographic you were just talking about, but also um, maybe bringing the messaging in around COVID-19 as a way to appeal. No, no, Dr. Flores, that's a, th thanks for the question. That's a great question. And so you're, you're seeing a couple of things here. One, literally what you would, you would expect from the campaigns. So this is going back to what I was saying earlier. You know, for the Biden-Harris team, as much as possible, you want to be this to be a referendum election. This is purely about what do you think about the current administration and, and who that's in control. So you can see the messaging there that's reflecting that. Didn't handle the coronavirus well. Look what's going on with social unrest, the impact on the economy. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of that kind of pounding in those to really say they didn't do their job, right? Now, they're also going to have a chunk of that to be also saying they have to have a little bit of this is what I stand for, but they don't want this to be a choice election. But if we're really honest, on um, the non-college educated voter, right? And we, we know that each group, there's other things that come in gender, it could be race, ethnicity, but when we look at that kind of category, it depends on what the other pieces are as well too. So if you're part of the Latino electorate, if you're part of the African American electorate, there's obviously that's connected to kind of education and working class voters as well. There's going to be targeted stuff that kind of combines the elements that it's not purely working class, but it may be a racial piece, an ethnic piece. The gender gap is massive. Women are going to, if, if, if Vice President Biden wins, it's all going to be primarily because of women. Um, so those things come into play across uh, the variables as well. Professor, our good friend Dwayne Robinson is asking, what are your thoughts about how things are going to end up with the Affordable Care Act? And can you talk a little bit about how that's playing in the campaigns? Clearly, you talked earlier about some of those persuadable voters being focused on the kitchen sink issues, not necessarily being, don't just hit me with anti-Trump. Uh, so, you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican messaging on it, how do you think the Affordable Care Act is playing in here? No, no, that's a great, great question, Dwayne. And so this is at the top of the list. It's one of the most important issues. Uh, and right now, it plays to the favor of the Biden-Harris team, right? So over time, Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act has become more and more popular, uh, and people don't want it to go away, all right? And so the Republicans have had the challenge that even for their base who are, want to see it repealed, uh, there's also been that notion about what will it be replaced with, right? So you can see 
a really going deep on the Biden-Harris side for both what is currently there and also, you saw last night in the debate, what's going to be taken away from you potentially, right, in the midst of a virus, right? And so, um, and, but, you know, you also heard today, I mean, I think I saw something today where the Trump administration is pushing really hard to make sure seniors get their $200 coupon for kind of drug prices and making sure it gets there before November the 3rd. So they obviously know that there has to be kind of a healthcare angle for them to try to hit as well, but they're in a, in a tougher spot. And of, course, and of course it ties to the Supreme Court messaging, right? Because you got the big case right after the election. So awesome. That's a, good point. Uh, a lot of Texans on the call. So I'm gonna wanna get to Erica Roach's question here, which is any predictions for whether Texas Democrats will uh, gain a majority in the state house in Texas? Uh, hey, Erica, great, great. Thanks for joining us. Great question. Uh, it's gonna be tough, right? So, but uh, the Democrats need nine seats to take control of the state house. Um, uh, if we go back to as recent as 2016, 2017, the Republicans had a 95 seat majority in the House of 150 seats. There's huge swing in 2018, two years ago when we picked, the Democrats picked up 21 seats, but you got to hold on to them. A lot of them were close races, so there's no guarantee that all of those are done. So it's when I tell my friends it's nine, but you got to hold on to the 21, right? So, or the 12, the 12 and the nine, that's the 21 total. I think there are 22 seats that they're targeting. It's possible. And, it, and it's, it's, it's been a long time since this was this close. Um, it's going to be a tough one though. It's going to be a tough one to make happen. Great. Um, here's a, a kind of different one. Looking beyond the election, how do we think about the potential for another situation where the electoral vote is different from the popular vote? Um, how do you this? Uh, how do you think about addressing the electoral college challenges after the election, and uh, what kind of issues might we watch for in the use of loopholes in the electoral college policies in this election? Great question. Uh, the possibilities really depend on the closeness of the race. If the race ends up being close again, there is a scenario that uh, the president gets reelected, and the most likely scenario is that an electoral vote. I get past two seventy but I lose the national popular vote, right? California, New York, big millions of kind of wasted votes in a sense, because you, you know where that state's already, those states are gonna go on the democratic side, for example. Um, so that's probably the most likely scenario where that would happen. If the race is anywhere near what the polling is showing now, or even if it closes a little bit, uh, it won't matter because it'll be a smaller victory in a way, but you'll have probably both pieces for the Biden-Harris team in terms of getting past 270 and winning the national popular vote as well. In terms of the, the future, you know, this is a tough one, right? Because the process of what it would take to change it is difficult. So it's not gonna be an easy thing. Um, and, you know, so I think uh, even though people are frustrated and would like to see, there's so many elements of both how people are saying, what could be different about, do Democrats, Republicans are worried about Democrats taking control and turning DC and Puerto Rico into states to add to the electoral vote to continue to play that game, but to change the numbers. Uh, while other people are saying, you know, going to the national popular piece at place, it obviously could be something that would kind of favor Democrats because of places like California and New York. But I think either, I think it's gonna be a while before the system changes just because of how difficult the process is to make that happen. Great, Gary uh, Greenblum is asking, there've been some concerted efforts to reach uh, previously unregistered voters. Any thoughts on how successful this has been in terms of getting more Lat Lat Latin, uh, Latino voters uh, registered? So thanks Gary, great question. Um, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, it's been trickier this time because of the virus, right? So people haven't been able to do uh, a lot of the traditional things that they've wanted to do around registration. Here's an interesting thing though, and once again, this will be the first cycle that Latinos nationally, now the key word is eligible, right? It's not in terms of turnout yet, but there actually will be more Latino eligible voters than there are African-American voters for the first time, right? Now, because the turnout is different, that doesn't mean the turnout's gonna be the same. So you're, you're seeing groups like Jolt, and there's a lot of other groups here in Texas and across the country who are doing really interesting kinds of things. So there's some great experiments going on. What I get a little worried about was a lot of them were put on hold a bit in a way uh, because of the virtual nature of how people had to shift their tactics. 
So that makes me a little nervous about whether they're actually going to be able to hit some of the goals they were hoping for. Great. We're at our last question. And I think it's only appropriate that uh, your son, Michael, gets to ask that last question. So I'm going to send this one over. Uh, sim <laughs> my, uh, similar to Ohio, do you think South Carolina is back in play uh, due to Jamie Harrison's fundraising strengths? And related to that, um, in light of news cycles being dominated by national news and so forth, do, you, do Senate level debates carry the same weight in their races as compared to previous elections, given the, again, the national, the intensity of the national fight? Uh, that's a great, great question, Michael. Um, so there's a couple things that I think we're seeing in South Carolina. You know, we didn't get a chance to go through all of the Senate races. So I would encourage you to go look at some of those real clear politics maps to see the 14 races that are out there. What's shocking to me is that South Carolina even has the potential to be a competitive race. And it looks like it is. So there's both the fundraising piece. But this is also another reminder to us that the suburbs are different now, right? And so people, you've got that going on in South Carolina and not just in Charleston, uh, you've got Columbia, you've got some other places. And we have this notion of what the suburbs, what we thought they were, but there's so many, David Wasserman is great about this, where he says, you know, there are some suburbs that you go to and it's Whole Foods and Lululemon, and there's some other ones and it's Dollar General and Hobby Lobby, right? So they're very distinct. And so they're not all the same, but South Carolina is one of those places Texas, we've got that around Plano and Allen, Texas, two of the wealthiest communities in Texas in the country where there potentially could be turning blue. And while it's still going to be a long shot for Jamie Harrison, but, it, but you see the potential there. And in this one, you can see there's obviously more interest kind of happening at the state level than what's probably happening from the presidential election. Um, so keep your eye on those. But the big thing is keep your eye on the new suburbs that are out there. And, and there's a, in a, both a question of college educated voters looking for great jobs that are now being placed in the suburbs, Plano corporate headquarters, blah, 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 but also a mix of the demographics of them becoming more folks of color who are in the mix as well. This is not a good thing, but some of the highest movement in poverty has been in the suburbs now around the country. That's not what we think of. So people need to think really differently about what the suburbs are today. Great, folks. We're going we're gonna to wind it up there. We had a few others I couldn't get to. I'm sorry about that, about things about the Green New Deal and uh, a whole bunch of other things. Uh, can we trust results coming out of Florida? And uh, what point should teens take away from this uh, debate and battle? And uh, uh, for, for other, other good questions, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but thank you, Professor Sepulveda. Do you want to say one minute in closing, then we'll hand back over to uh, uh, Gary uh, Remy to close us out tonight. No, I just want to say thanks, Dan. Thanks for kind of doing this with, uh, with me tonight. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, this was great. I, I just really, the final thing I'll say to folks is with all the stuff that's kind of going on, it's really important for you to get out and vote, right? So make your plan, get out there. I'm voting next Tuesday, right? Getting it done as soon as I can. So it's, this is a very critical election. So I would really encourage you to make sure that we, we all get that kind of done. So make your plan here. For those of you who are connected to Trinity, We've got students who are helping people make their plans. So alums, you can get, if you've got questions, you can kind of get connected to that as well. But uh, I just want to say thanks to everybody who kind of joined us tonight. And thanks again, Dan. Great. Over to, you, over to you, Gary. Well, thanks very much. I'm sure that everyone who's been watching this and listening to it and submitting questions feels like I do, that Trinity is extremely fortunate to have Professor Sepulveda available with his expertise to share that understanding of our campaigns and our election system with our Trinity students and with the broader Trinity community. So I hope you have enjoyed this evening's presentation as much as I have. I'm sure you have, and I know that uh, we've all learned a lot. For more information about future webinars, podcasts, and book club information, please visit Trinity's Alumni Relations Lifelong Learning page. And you should find a link in your chat function to that lifelong learning page. Our next food for thought is the healing role of music, scheduled for Wednesday, October 21st at 5.30 p.m. Central Time. The discussion will be led by Trinity University Professor Carrie Lattimore, KRTU radio station general manager J.J. Lopez, and uh, poet laureate, rather, Andrea Vokab-Sanderson. 
For more information on upcoming Food for Thought lectures, call 210-999-7375. Again, that's 210-999-7375. Let me thank you, and I am sure that everyone participating would join, if we could, in a virtual round of applause for Professor uh, Sepulveda and for our moderator tonight, Dan Abbasi. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and go Tigers.